You are listening to Leadership, powered by Common Sense, with your host, Doug Thorpe. Today, I've got a very special guest with me. She happens to be one of my colleagues in the Silver Fox Advisors, but she also is a certified EOS implementer. We're going to talk a lot more about what that is if you're not familiar with it. And I want to say welcome to my guest, Rainy Busby. Rainy, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be on the program with you this morning. Lots of fun stuff to talk about. You betcha. Likewise. Before we really get into the nuts and bolts of what in the world EOS means and is, uh, let's let's talk first a little bit about your own background. How did you kind of get to where you are and then add, explain to the folks what you are doing today? All right. So, uh, yeah, I have been an entrepreneur for yeah, 16, 17 years now. I uh, love business. It's business is in my DNA. I started out as a software engineer, interestingly enough. It was uh, where you think software, but it's the systems and processes side, operations of different businesses. And I spent about 25 years doing that. Been involved in uh, you know $13 billion turnaround. Uh, I know it was waste management. That's how I ended up in Houston. Lots of startups, uh, many different industries, uh, held numerous leadership positions. So um, I was looking for an opportunity to take all of that um, expertise and understanding and systems and operations and bring it to the next level. And I ended up moving into the human capital space, which is really um, people strategy. It's like, how can we get the most out of our, our people and our organization and understanding where they are? For example, if someone's a high potential, we want them to be able to grow to that next level, right? So we got to wrap a lot of development around them. So I spent about seven years as an expert in that area and then um, decided to do something completely different. I had had my own businesses going on and I said, you know what? I really want to just kind of be a solo entrepreneur, right? I I didn't want to have a lot of consultants and everything working for me. And so I was in this uh, Vistage meeting. I was a Vistage member and they showed me this book traction and I'm like, what the heck is that book? And so I, you know, opened it up. And I'm like, I was already doing that work, but this is a model and it's got a community all built around it. And so that's how I transitioned into being a solo entrepreneur. And I've been uh, running my practice for about six years now. I've worked with over 50 different companies, mostly privately held, fast growing entrepreneurial leadership teams. And I literally love what I do. I get to change people's lives every single day. And it's a, it's a blessing. Well, that's amazing. You know, the entrepreneurial journey is, is a very interesting one. And anyone that has attempted to create and run a small business knows that uh, you kind of get hit in the face on day one with the things you don't know about trying to uh, create and establish a, a viable, successful business. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about that book and, and the kind of the high level summary of what the entrepreneur operating system is all about. Sure. So the entrepreneurial operating system, which we call EOS for short, is really a set of powerful tools. It's a model. So it's not really software. It's literally a foundation to put into your business. And it's made specifically for fast growing smaller companies, which are usually neglected in the space. And so we look for companies about 10 to 250 employees that are really ready to take it to that next level. So this is good companies that want to be better. They want to kind of up their game. And so when we look at this model, we're like, well, how does it add value back into the business? There's really three key pieces. It's your vision. It's getting really laser focused, crystal clear. Where are you going? How are you going to get there? And most importantly, how each and every employee is going to help you achieve that vision. And then the traction side of it, which is also the title of the book, that's really making that vision reality through execution, discipline, and accountability. And then finally, the healthy, and that's creating a healthy organization where people love what they do. They love the business and the services and products. And you bring that all together. I work with the leadership team. So we say, as goes the leadership team, so goes the rest of the organization. And everybody gets some EOS love. And so in this traction book, um, basically, it is uh, a textbook. So we give these tools away. You can use someone like myself to guide you along this journey of implementation, or you can do it yourself. 
And so I like to tell folks, if you are really looking to try a few of those tools, this is the book to do. Um, if you want to see uh, what it's like working with someone like me, get a grip. This is a fable of an IT company working with an implementer named Alan. So it kind of gives you a little bit of overview of, of the EOS tool. That's great. And, and the whole traction network uh, uh, globally, uh, you, you got a certification in it, right? They, they have training and development that they do for professionals like yourself to help others. That is correct. So we are held to certain standards. So I am a certified EOS implementer. Um, we have uh, different ways that we gauge whether you're professionally trained or certified. And so, yeah, that is a, um, a key part of the model. We're always learning, always sharpening our tools because we learn from our community. So right now there are I have 430 implementers such as myself of different various variations of discipline. And we're also in 15 different countries. So we've, we've implemented over 10,000 companies worldwide and, and growing like crazy. So people are really starting to embrace this, the effectiveness and the simplicity of this tool and just um, taking off with it. And so we, we estimate a people that self-implement and just buy this book there's probably well over 100, 150,000 companies that have done that on their own. And I'm give back, give first is our, one of our core values. And we do, I talk to folks all the time, like, call me, I'll help you with that tool. They're like, all right, this is awesome. So, yeah. Yeah, well, that, that's great. And I, I can attest to that too. I've, uh, I've got the book in my library, studied it well. And I, um, uh, while I haven't uh, attempted the certification process, I, I love the model and the principles behind it. And um, I, I think what I'd like to do is touch on a couple of the key points. And maybe this is in the no particular order. Sure. But I know I'm a big champion of the concept of having a vision for what you're doing. You know, scripture mm -hmm. tells us without vision, the people perish. And I think that is very true, whether you're in an executive leadership role in a large corporation or you are an entrepreneur. If, if you don't have a crystal clear vision of exactly what you're about and where you want to go, uh, you know, as they say, any road will get you there. So... <laughs> Talk a little bit more about how that plays out in the, in the, in the model for traction. Sure. So um, I always like to say, uh, if I was walk if I walk into a leadership room and there's eight people in the room and I take each one of them out into the hallway and I say, what's the vision for the company? Where are we going? I would get as many different answers as the number of people that I talk to. So just imagine the confusion that's being spread across the organization. So we need to make sure everybody is singing the same song from the same sheet of music. And so within the tool, there's a two-page strategy document, and it's really focused on eight different questions that helps us to get laser focused on that vision and the strategy to execute so that we can share that with everyone in the organization. So it's not just up here in the leadership or owner's head. Everybody knows what it is and where we're heading towards, right? So it sets us up as a I use a lot of sports analogies, but we got the team on the field, they're ready to play the game and they're ready to win. And so those questions, just real briefly, your core values and real core values, not lip service, right? Our behaviors, expectations, who we are, our core focus, which is what's our why? Why do we do what we do? That, that footprint outside of our organization. What's our niche? What we, what's our mastery? What we do specifically? 10-year target. So what do we look like in 10 years? Start to really reach out and, and vision planning. And then we get a, a summary of our marketing strategy so that everybody understands what our perfect customer looks like, what separates us from our competition. And then there could be some processes like a, how we engage with prospects and guarantees. And then the cool part is that three-year picture, which is really when the teams start getting engaged and excited because we paint a picture, 10 to 15 bullet points of what they look like in three years. And then we say, okay, if that's us in three years, what do we need to do this year to march towards that vision? And so we put together a one-year plan. Everybody's probably very familiar, five to seven smart goals. And then we break them down every quarter. What do we need to do this quarter to move each one of those goals forward? And that literally is your strategy document. Simple two pages, which is fabulous for small businesses. That's great. It, it is, a, is clear and concise and it... Uh... 
I think a lot of people get discouraged with the notion of planning and forecasting mm. and creating that vision because <clears throat> wherever they've been or whatever they're used to, they've got this this idea that it has to be some giant three ring binder that they're going to build. Mm. And uh, yeah. we all know those binders never get used after they get created. So, <laughs> You're like, I don't know where to start. I got this great plan, but now what? That's where yeah. many, even big, huge corporations, because that used to be my target. And they would be, they'd be the same way. Well, we did this two day executive session. Now we've got our plan. Uh, what do we do next? Right. We right. put it on the shelf, as you mentioned, and then we get it out. Maybe the third quarter to see, Oh, let's see what progress we're How making. We uh, <laughs> really crazy. That that does not work. You need it. The human brain needs that 90 day reset to get refocused so that we can be really effective in executing. That's great. That's great. Well, let's, um, let's move on to the next big area, and maybe this is what I would call one of my favorite ones. When an entrepreneur decides he, he or she can no longer do it by themselves, they want to start hiring people. Um, typically, this is the, the, the immediate next step when an entrepreneur gets in trouble, because who do you hire? You hire friends <laughs> and family, right? <laughs> because you, I think that the thought in your mind is, well, I can trust these guys with my baby. Mm -hmm. I, I can, I can, you know, I, I can allow that to happen, but uh, I'm not going to lead the witness here. What's wrong with that, Rainey? <laughs> well, we have a tendency to hire people that we like, and I do a lot of work with family business and there's a whole different dynamic. We have to be really clear. And are you speaking as a family member? Are you speaking as a leadership team member? Are you speaking as an employee, as an owner, right? So segmenting that conversation. But one of the uh, first opportunities that I would recommend to someone who's looking to start to scale their organization is we have what we call an accountability chart. And it looks like an org chart. Org chart's a great HR tool, but it's not to be used to start to ramp up and scale your organization. So even just going through that exercise, which it walks you through it in the book traction and just start to frame out what will my organization look like for the next maybe six to nine months? What positions will I need to fill? And so we look at it as functions and then what are the five to seven roles within that function? Once we get that defined, then we start looking for the people to put in the boxes, not the other way around. Typically, they're going to go find this person. Let's see where I can plug and play him. No, let's figure out what we need, then find the best talents. I'm always encouraging my clients to kind of raise the bar, bring in the great people who can grab and grasp that vision and get excited about your three-year picture and make it happen. Yeah, you know, I, I think that's great advice, that whole idea of, of mapping out the accountability for the, the, the real work you need to have accomplished and segment that in whatever framework makes sense and then go seek the talent that and and you're right i think for a lot of entrepreneurs that model is exactly upside down from where they they want to start the other mm -hmm. thing that um i see happening a lot and i was uh, i was kind of introduced to a concept by a a guy that's in the placement business and that is if you're sitting there owning your company and you want to go from 500,000 to 3 million, if you've got one of these accountability boxes defined for, say, sales, mm -hmm. well, you don't want to hire a sales guy that does 300,000. You want to hire the sales guy that's already doing 5 million that's to, right. to, to take you there. And if they already know how to do work at that level, and that's not limited to sales, that's limited to operations management. It's, 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 um, it includes your administration, any service support, any of the functions mm -hmm. you come up with. You want to find the person that's already been operating at that higher level that's your, your stretch goal so that um, they can take you there rather than you trying to grow them up to that level. Mm -hmm. So a couple of great points that you made is that we have to bring in people that have the skills and expertise that as an owner or as an entrepreneur, we don't have those skills, right? We want people who have already been there, done that, because we don't want to create a training ground. Small companies don't have the finances and the bandwidth to do that. Another key point you made is that we can't be really strong in sales 
and not be strong in operations and our financial controls, right? They all have to be equally strong because if we're strong in sales and our operations are struggling, we're just going to churn those great customers that we found and brought in because we're not delivering those products and services as we promised. And then we have to have those financial controls or our money just kind of goes through our fingers and we really don't know, are we pricing correctly? Are we even making a profit? Are we healthy financially? So it's that balance across that organization that's so critical. Well, that's great stuff, Randy. And uh, we're going to take a short break and we'll be right back and continue our discussion on the EOS, the Entrepreneur Operating System. This program is sponsored by Headway Executive Coaching, your source for leadership development and team leading effectiveness. For more information, visit headwayexec.com. Com. Well, hello again, everyone. We're back. And today I'm talking with a uh, friend, colleague, and certified EOS implementer, Rainy Busby. We've been talking about the uh, system called the Entrepreneur Operating System. We were talking about uh, the visioning for your company and the people side of it. But let's, uh, let's pick up a couple of the other themes that might come out of EOS, Rainy. What, what have we left off so far? Oh, so probably the most important is communication, all right? So um, in everything, in our work relationships, our personal relationships, we have to have clear, consistent communication. And so one of the tools that we use, and probably the biggest complaint I hear, is meetings. I hate meetings. It's a big waste of time. We do a whole lot of talking and no action. And so we have a template that we use, and it's a structured agenda. And it's an hour and a half meeting for the leadership team. First 25 minutes, we know where we are in all of our measurables, which is our leading indicator activity. So that's our scorecard. We know where all the rock statuses are, which are the most important things. Kind of think of them as little projects to move the business forward. Because entrepreneurs like to be in the business and the leadership team, but we have to carve time out to be on the business to move the business forward, or we're going to be on that hamster wheel. So that's that's really a key part as well. And then we spend the next 60 minutes solving issues. Issues are ideas, opportunities, obstacles, frustrations, anything that's not working, that's slowing us down, or could be an opportunity for us to explore we need to tee it up and have a conversation as a leadership team. So we have a structure that we teach them how to use and so that we can solve it once and for all. We get down to the root cause of this problem and then we take an action to solve and then it's done. And so the cool part is that many times we think we solve issues, but we don't because we're solving the symptoms and not the root. Mm-hmm. And then that issue comes back. And you're like, I thought we solved that. And we're like, no, you just solved the symptom. The problem's still there. And so it's really interesting to watch the transformation of the leadership team because now they get where each other is coming from and they get a better understanding of all the different functions in the organization. And so you create a more collaborative environment. And then what you also do is you create an opportunity for um, kind of that reduction of silos that many times come up in our organization, right? Because people kind of get in their own little world. And so it just creates that really awesome net across the organization. That's uh, very powerful and very important, but um, I I think to to do all this, it requires a pretty powerful and significant mind shift for the owner. It does. And let's talk about that a little bit. If 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 I'm an owner, I've got this whiz bang idea that I think I'm going to just you know conquer the world with. As I start getting into this, what are some of the common themes that you find with owners and reasons that either consciously or subconsciously, they kind of push back on this? Mm -hmm. So um, the mind shift, I think, more than anything is because when we start out as entrepreneurs, we're kind of involved in everything. We've got our fingers in all the different pots, right? And so what we need to do is take a step back. And look at where is where are our real strengths at? Where do we provide the most value? And then we delegate everything else. And we hold people accountable to doing what they're supposed to do. If that does not happen, if that leader is not willing to delegate and trust and empower people, they become a bottleneck. And I always like to say, you know, you've got this funnel and all these people are coming through and all these activities and it's got to go through one person, 
And so it just slows everything down. And it basically, at many times, we call it hitting the ceiling, will cause a company to go out of business. So we've got to do something different to get over that that hurdle that we've just hit. So there's just a little bump in the road and we keep right on going because it's going to happen every three to five years. We have to change mentally to be able to move to that next level. That's probably one of the biggest challenges that I see and that entrepreneur needs to be ready for that. They have to be willing to do things differently, to be vulnerable, to be able to put the leadership team in charge and to kind of step back a little bit, focus more on the vision and, you know, really truly staying in their role where they add that value. I, I share a lot of that same experience. I, I talk about it in, in some of my articles and in uh, my coaching where I actually put a name on it. I call it the paradox of success as a company takes off and starts to actually get its own traction for results. Mm -hmm. Um, there's frequently kind of the, the notion of hitting an invisible wall that the owner is not willing to make the mind shift to open up the thinking and step away from the, the details of the business. And as you said, work on the business rather than in the business. And that can be a fatal decision point. I learned it many years ago in my banking days. I watched companies that were privately owned mm -hmm. uh, have, have some phenomenal early success and crumble because the ownership could not make the next step. Yeah, yeah. Um, sad, but uh, so true. And it comes, you know, when I start working with the team, there's varying levels of trust within the within that leadership team. And so we run them through some exercises, which I'm sure you you do in your practice as well, is to help them to build trust and really understand where each other is coming from. But it's, you know, if we think about, you know, Patrick Lencioni is one of my favorite authors, and he has the five dysfunctions of a team, which we teach during our annual session with clients. And the foundation of that pyramid is trust. And so you don't trust, you won't step into those difficult conversations, you won't buy in on the decision made of the team, and we can't have an owner coming in and saying, well, I don't agree with that, we're going to move this direction. It needs to be a collaborative, cohesive decision made by that team, and then once we decide the direction, we're all moving forward in a united front and communicating that to the organization, because if that does not happen, we will not be successful. Yeah. And, you know, for those out there that may be listening and you own a small business and you're saying, yeah, guys, but I, I you, you don't understand. I don't want to lose my vision. I don't want to lose the values I think my brand's going to represent. That's okay. You can be the, the visionary for the, the cause. You, you can keep the flag. You can keep the standard that you want to create. But I think the point here is there's a, there's a mind shift and a process for being able to properly communicate that vision, hold people accountable for the achievement of that vision, mm -hmm. and uh, leverage talent that you can assemble to execute on the vision, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't, we're not talking about giving up your baby. No, no, not at all. What I find most often is my clients, the owners, are visionaries, right? They are the face to the community. They're the person out there networking. They're building relationships with their largest clients. And they're really looking at the market and where are we going next? And what opportunities do we have? That's their magic, right? But they find themselves down in the day-to-day -day operations, you know, making sure our products are getting out and all the things that pulls them away from that that place where they're so empowered. And so we need to get them back up into that visionary role because it's so important to the company moving forward. Because, I mean, we've seen some drastic changes during this pandemic. So we truly need to be looking at what's next. Where did our market shift? Who moved our cheese, right? Where's the cheese at now? And those companies that were able to make that quick shift because that visionary had their eye on the market and what was changing external from the organization, mm -hmm. they are the most successful companies. Because if you just sit there and think, well, things are going to change and my business is going to be back as it was, that's not our reality of our world, not today. 
and not going forward. So uh, talk to us about the kind of the ideal prospect company that you like to work with. So um, it's really quite interesting. This model is so flexible that I work with both for-profit and non-profit. So one of my best clients is a church, and it has been transformational because the cool part is that this model applies to every employee and every volunteer and every third-party vendor that you're depending on, right? So you think about you know the for-profit or the non-profit, um, 10 to about 250 employees sweet spot. I have smaller I mean, I use it in my, my practice is me and my assistant and I have very large up to 600, a thousand employees, but it's really that psychographic. It's what's important to, to them in moving forward. And they have to be open and honest and vulnerable and willing to empower that leadership team. And they're really pretty healthy companies. This is not for broken companies because there's a reason they're broken (laughs) and they usually have to start at the top. But this is for companies who truly want to move forward. They have a vision and a plan they want to achieve, and they're willing to empower that leadership team to make collective decisions to move it forward. Yeah, yeah. I'm guessing, and I may be putting you on the spot here, uh, you said typically not for broken companies, but if, if the owner is being honest with themselves and calling it broken and saying, I need help fixing it, this can work for them, right? Oh, absolutely. Um, it, it's that mental shift of wanting to do something different. I always like to say what got us here is not going to get us there. We have to change in many, many different ways. And so um, also it's, it's always, a, I just get it, I, I chuckle. I just can't help it. But when I'm meeting with prospects for the first time and I say, so what's going on in your business? And I have like a 20 minute open dialogue and they're just telling me what's where are your strengths? Where are your challenges? And they're like, I bet you haven't heard that before, you know, because they feel like they're like the only one. But I'm like, only every single conversation I'm in, I say, you guys are normal. You guys are so normal. So it's okay. You've had a lot of people around you that have those same challenges and dysfunctions. But the difference between you is that you want to do something about it and move away from that. So it is so funny. And they feel so, you just see like, oh, okay, so we're not really like, you know, the the, the big kids, they, they can't get anything done kind of thing. So it's funny. Yeah. Yeah. I've had a client this past year that um, when we first started working, um, she was very concerned about the future of her company because of some dysfunction that had emerged with a couple of the people that she had brought on the team. And there was just, just some bad negative energy going on with expectations and, and following the vision. So, we went through a process of really starting with her vision, looking at what she really wanted to achieve, and then testing that accountability chart, you know, that org chart that is just about function, and realized that coincidentally, the two or three employees that were causing the most trouble just weren't fits. There was not a good box on the chart <laughs> to sit in. So I convinced her to let them go. Just and, and, you know, that was more than 50% of her workforce at the time. And so she was really worried about execution, but, um, she did it. And then we really redefined her hiring process Mm -hmm. and fast forward about four months. She's found two new people to take the place of three. So she's saving money on, uh, payroll and has probably doubled the capacity she had before because she's, oh, yeah. she's got the right people doing the right stuff. And she hired up. She hired people that were already used to working at this higher level that she was trying to achieve. And um, I was in a, actually a team workshop she had a couple of weeks ago, and it, it, the, the energy in the room was palpable. <laughs> you, you know they're going somewhere now. So it was uh, it was very rewarding to have been the coach to kind of help help her through that, but uh, to see it in play. Uh, the point being, it can happen. Oh, and that's quite common. Um, I have seen in many, many, many cases at least a fifty percent turnover in the leadership team, and quite a bit of turnover in the staff as well. 
because we settle for people and we put up with a lot of things we shouldn't be putting up with because they're bringing us down. And so your example was spot on. I may have had four people doing all this work before, but if I bring in the best of the best, I can get it done with two people. Maybe I pay them a little bit more, but it's still saving me money and saving you a lot of headache because now you have the right people. So we always say, get the right people, fit our core values, get them in the right seat on the accountability chart so that they're in their, their magical place, what they do best and what's so part of their DNA. And then you just turn them loose and you make sure that that balance is sustainable. So we never bring in people that don't fit our core values. They're, they're, they're just going to kind of chip away at our core values if we're not careful because they'll right. try to make them themselves. Right. right? They're all Absolutely. about their core values. Absolutely. Well, Randy, this has been phenomenal. We're going to have to wrap it up here. Um, tell, tell people how they can get uh, in touch with you. Yeah. So um, feel free to reach out. Uh, our website is uh, rainybusby.com, R-A-I-N-E-E-B-U-S-B-Y.com. And you can uh, send us an email. There's all kinds of contact forms. I'm happy to jump on a call with you and just kind of chat through some things, send you free templates if you're interested in the templates. I'm happy to do a little coaching to get you started. Um, or if you're interested in talking to me about coming in and working with your leadership team, I like to say I'm uh, your guide. I'm going to teach you how to climb the mountain. I need to make sure that you have all your equipment mentally, physically prepared, and I'm going to take you up the right path, and then you're ready to graduate. You can do this all on your own. So I'm happy to open up a conversation around that as well. Well, that's great. Well, Rainy, thank you for being on the show today. And uh, I, um, we, we will post the contact info here in the trailer as we exit. But uh, thank you for listening, and we will see you in the next episode. Thank you so much. It was great spending time with you and getting to share a little bit of this wonderfulness of EOS. Very good. Very good. All right. Oh, bye, everybody. Thank you. This has been Leadership Powered by Common Sense, hosted by Doug Thorpe. For more information, visit us on the web at DougThorpe.com.